Oh. All right. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to In the Minds of Monsters and Men, the psychology of the Witcher. Uh, I am your moderator for this panel. My name is Dr. Kelly Dunlap. I am the community director at Take This, which is a mental health nonprofit dedicated to serving the gaming community. Um, I'm a licensed and practicing clinical psychologist, and I also have a master's in game design. And I love looking at how mental health shows up in games from design, um, from characters, representation, and everything in between. And I'm gonna allow my panelists to introduce themselves as well. I'm gonna start down here with Celeste. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Celeste San Giorgio. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm research faculty at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I split my time between practice, um, so care directly with patients, and with research. And my um, practice focuses on co-occurring substance use and violence. And my research focuses on um, using digital mediums like narrative games and digital platforms to treat co-occurring substance use and violence. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amelia Herbst. I'm a postdoctoral resident at SavePoint Behavioral Health. Um, at SavePoint, we predominantly treat geeks, gamers, and people in the tech and gaming industry. Uh, so I get to play video games with my clients a lot. So I think I'm winning in the career department right now. Um, otherwise, I'm also the vice president of the board of directors of this cute little con in Seattle, which is awesome, called Geek Girl Con. Um, it's it's a, it's a little place where it's safe for pretty much everyone, and I enjoy kind of being able to help them out. I've just now realized this isn't my in-suits 5.30 yoga class, so, <laughs> you know, we'll roll with it. Hi, my name's Christopher Leach. Uh, I'm a pronoun to he, him. I am a PhD researcher in psychology, looking at video games and mental health. I then, like most people in 2024, also produce content of various things, a podcast, you know, do some mental health and disability, you know, like advocacy, you know, making noise, you know, that's what I do. I mean, as you can see from the slide, I am a megaphone because I don't have any fancy letters yet. So Soon. I make a lot of noise. Soon. Soon. Hopefully, one day. Hello, hello, my name is Anxiety. I am a uh, talk show host in the topics of mental health and all the things. I also do not have any letters in front of my name. I'm just really, really into psychology and nerding out over stuff that I really like, which one of the things is uh, The Witcher. I am on the Take This review board, community review board. I'm a Take This ambassador. Um, I've written other stuff and also just here to fangirl, so. Megaphones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Megaphones go. We, we sat like this on purpose. We're yeah. like, put, put all the, yeah, oh, she heard. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. You're good. You're all good. <laughs> um, so we have a bunch of psychologists and mental health people, advocates up here. Um, we've all written professionally about The Witcher as well. And if you're interested in that, you can see on the bottom, it says the site guys to pop culture The Witcher. You can actually download it for free if you're interested. You can also, uh, it is possible to get hard covers, which are very, very cool. And I may have a couple under the table in case anyone's in Witcher cosplay. Just saying, something to think about. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out, I'm gonna ask each panelist something specific about the chapter they wrote, and then we're gonna open it up to broader discussions. I'm gonna start with Celeste, because Celeste has a panel starting at 6.30, uh, so they're gonna need to roll out a little bit early. So you get to, you get to go first. Uh, Celeste, your, pan your panel, your chapter was, uh, what is love? Tris, don't hurt me. And uh, Tris, I already hear the grumblings. Um, Tris gets a lot of hate across all of the mediums that, that The Witcher touches on. Um, so what do you think that people are missing or misunderstanding about her? Um, so I think uh, I, I really appreciated the opportunity to do a deep dive on this character. And I think that Tris has a very, emo like she has an emotional journey in the books and in the games, and I think people also have an emotional attachment to how the narrative uh, is formed and the direction. They feel invested in the direction of the plot, and I think when you have an emotional connection, it's hard not to have an emotional response to the things that feel wrong in the plot. So I think that that's where a lot of that uh, reaction comes from. Um, my first entry into the Witcher series was actually uh, The Witcher 3, and so I didn't have that um, whole like book series behind me when I first engaged, so I didn't see the subversion of a plot that I was familiar with, but I imagine that if I did, I would be very uncomfortable to know that the characters have had such a journey, and then that journey was just like gone, kind of. Um, and 
Uh, I think that in general, in the books and in the game, Triss is, is she's, she's not a flat character. She's a very dynamic character. Um, and I think no matter what response you have, you can connect to her identity and development journey um, across the, the books, across the game. And I think that's what I tried to really capture in the chapter. Nice. I think you did too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass it down to Amelia. I'm not going to say the name of your chapter because you're going to say it because it's about our, um, it's called The Psychology of Monstrosity, and then you, you finish it. Uh, which is about Emil Regis Raholik Terosif Goldfroy, better known as Regis. Yes. We Thank will you. The few people that like are really clapping, you're my humans. I want you to know that. <laughs> so Regis, we're going to call him Regis from here on out. Um, so your chapter is really a love letter to, to Regis. And so despite being a vampire, you talk about him as the pinnacle of humanity. Can you say why that is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the Netflix viewers, you're about to be spoiled out the wazoo, just an FYI. Um, so Regis shows up in the third book in the saga uh, called The Baptism of Fire. If we think about humanity, humanity is an individual or a concept in which we think about empathy, compassion, the willingness to put ourselves aside for other people, for other things, for the rest of, for the rest of humanity, right? Um, Regis, uh, despite being what Gerald would consider a monster, which is a vampire, um, demonstrates these aspects of humanity far more than pretty much any other character in the entire series. I'm saying books, I'm saying Netflix, I'm saying games. We don't quite find a character like Regis. Um, in the books specifically, this was a creature that Geralt threatened. Uh, Regis knew that Geralt was a witcher, but he still came and followed them down and tried to heal Dandelion. Um, he put himself in harm's way multiple times to save individuals that were likely going to end up dead, that were going to end up in more harm if he hadn't done it, even if that meant unmasking himself. You know, um, there's this one particular part where he steps in during a literal baptism of fire and grabs a horseshoe out of a coal pit and holds it in his hand. And to Geralt right away, that's all like red, <laughs> red alert, big alarms, this isn't right. It's like a human can't do this. Um, but if he didn't do that, the young woman they were going to execute wouldn't have survived. Um, one of the best parts of the books is towards the end, Regis throws, uh, spoilers, <laughs> Regis throws himself in front of Yennefer and he ends up getting melted into the column of Stiga Castle. According to books, this is where Regis dies. Um, and Regis's death incites this fury and this passion in Geralt where he's actually able to finally like take Vilgefortz down. And when he has a conversation with Yen afterwards, she's like, who was that? And he talks about this vampire being his friend. He wasn't a human, but he was the peak of humanity. And when we see him in the Blood and Wine DLC in the third Witcher game, he does that, but he also totally puts aside some of his big rational thoughts, which we know that he's known for in the books, because he wants to believe so badly that a friend of his couldn't do anything that was actually going to harm an entire city of people until he was proven wrong. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of feelings. There's a lot of feelings there. Do you like him? <laughs> maybe, maybe a lot. Uh, so you, you brought up Yen, and so I'm going to actually jump over to, to M there on the far side. Um, so you wrote the chapter, Psychology, Psychology of Attachment, Yennefer of Wengerberg. Um, there's a lot that can and has been said about Yen, but you were like, I'm writing a chapter focused on attachment theory. And so how did, like, how did that come about, and why did you feel like that was a good way to explore Yen? Um, the very, very short answer to that question is pregnancy hormones. Now hear me out. Uh, so uh, attachment theory gets uh, quite a bit of treatment just in pop psychology in general. A lot of people talk about you know, being securely and securely attached um, and being somebody from a, having a traumatic childhood, much maybe not you know, being raised in a pig style like Yen, but it wasn't great. Um, and it was definitely, a, like attachment theory in general was definitely top of my mind because 
I would like to raise a securely attached child, as most, you know, probably parents would like for their kids. Um, and so as I'm reading through this, uh, and we're going through The Witcher, and um, I'm talking to Rachel, realizing that all of those things connect, um, and then the pattern coming through of how fascinating it was that Yennefer's, Yennefer's story of redemption follows very well in the steps of uh, the progression of somebody who goes from being very insecurely attached to having a secure attachment. Because on the surface, I think, in the series, you just think, wow, this is really cool. You know, she comes from nothing. Um, obviously, she has maybe not so great of a relationship with the opposite sex because she has daddy issues, like on a very, very surface Freudian pop psychology level. Um, but then as you go further, you're like, cool, this, this person is redeeming themselves um, and you know, standing, not only just standing up for others, but uh, she goes to her past lover, she reconciles, she apologizes, uh, she recognizes the importance of, uh, in, in the books, and we're getting there in the series, recognizes the importance of Geralt, and slowly starts letting him in, despite the fact that she knows that she could be hurt, because Geralt is just another dude at the end of the line, and she feels like, you know, Dudes have shown all of their cards to her. Um, and so watching her, real, it, it, on one hand, uh, you know, the theory of attachment is that you can, you can start, uh, for lack of a better term, broken and feeling alone and not being able to trust other people into coming to your own, learning to trust yourself enough to be able to then let somebody else in and have a healthier relationship. And so um, where we kind of uh, leave Yen off, even in just in the third book in her relationship with Gerald, this, this recognition that I am okay without you, but I want you here, Gerald, even though I know that just like everybody else, you can hurt me. And then, you know, Gerald's got his own issues. Uh, but it's just, it's really, it was really cool to watch her progression as I was interested in attachment theory, then interested in The Witcher, connecting the dots, and then being like, oh, this, this writes itself. Like, this character means so much to me as somebody who has this redemption arc, and then seeing that it lines up so perfectly with the theory was really just really cool. Go, Yen. <laughs> <laughs> Team Yen. All right, and last but certainly not least, Chris, you went in a little di different direction with your chapter. You didn't actually talk about a character. You did an entire chapter on the ethics, the ethics of the Witcher Code. And so I'm curious for you, what's something from the Witcher Code that you have maybe embraced in your own life? So I really, I want, I want to stress this to, to the audience. This kind of came, came at me from nowhere. I was uh, actually on a Beatles bus tour uh, with Rachel at the time, and you know, she was like, okay, I'm doing this book, and she, she may have pitched me ideas that other people, maybe on this very panel, ended up writing about. And I was like, let me, let me sit on that, let me think about it. And I went back, and the next day, we were chatting, and I went, okay, hear me out. Ethics, though. The entire morality of what people think is right and wrong. I want to write about that. <laughs> um, which... And for context, I was only on like the second book of short stories. I was like, yeah, he's banging on about this Witcher code a lot, you know? <laughs> like maybe I should like, there's something to write about here. Um, luckily I was right. So I should have put the Lotto one because ethics actually develops into a huge theme across the books as a whole, right? And even in the games that like, you make choices, that's ethics. Um, so any, any armchair philosophers in? Any ethical fans, no? You're all, you're all deeply immoral, okay. <laughs> all right, okay, that's cool. I, I understand where we are. So the bad things you can do in The Witcher, anyway. Um, so I think one of the things I really wanted to get across, and I will actually answer your question eventually. Um, okay. But like, when you think about how the world The Witcher is situated in functions, multiple kingdoms, multiple political groups, and things like this, there's actually such a really great ecosystem of what people think is right and wrong, particularly when there's so much war 
right? That really changes the way people feel about things and the way people will do things during those times that they wouldn't do. I think I literally pre present the reader with like a miniature trolley problem to get across what ethics is, right? Like when is it okay to do this or that? So within the context of the Witcher code, it was really interesting that essentially like Geralt just goes, yeah, it's fake. Um, just not saying when I want to get out of a job. And the thing that I've taken with me is that it's okay to lie when you don't want to do something if you say it's against your moral principles. So that is something that I do <laughs> regularly. I say, actually, that really goes against my beliefs and like the Chris code that I have. Um, so it would be really deeply and morally unethical for me to do that. Ergo, I'm going to not do it. It's not gone so well in work, I'll be honest. <laughs> like, they're a little bit shaky, but you, you know, you've got to keep trying, right? Okay, so that's a good, that's a good takeaway. Uh, lying. Gotcha. Um, so kind of now opening it up to, to everybody. Um, one of the things that I know has always sat with me about the, the Witcher, the, the books, the series, the, the video game, um, is that there's a lot of mental health content in the books, not just in the characters, but within their relationships and within the broader world itself. So it's like a super broad question here, but how do you think the Witcher, any of the versions, handles mental health? Celeste, when you want to start? Okay. Um, so I had a colleague who was also a therapist who uh, compared being a therapist to being a detective um, because what you're really doing is you're searching for clues and you're getting a deeper and deeper understanding of what the origin point is of someone's pathology, right? Their psychopathology. So what is the path to the psychological symptoms that they're having? And I think... Um, pretty much all witchers go out and they, they do that, right? They go into a town and they do detective work and they get a sense of what's happened, uh, what's the emotional temperature read, what's the culture of this town, and what's led into the, almost like this, I'm gonna use some old school psych terms, like psychic crystallization uh, in, uh, into like a monster, right? Or into like a being. And I think a really good example of this in The Witcher 3 is um, with that, uh, I forget the exact name, but the horrifying baby plotline. <laughs> um, not the most, yeah, tasteful um, at points, but um, you can really see how the trauma and this intergenerational trauma and how people hurt each other has turned into something that either can cause further harm or be healed through a very intentional pathway. So... Yeah, there's mental health themes across everything in The Witcher. Um, we look at Siri and even thinking about trauma, just everything that Siri's been through. When you read the books and you hear everything that she's between um, what happens to her family, between being separated from Geralt, uh, the pull of all of these different entities and politics that want to use her for different means. Um, just the girl has aces. Like, I think she checks all of those boxes. Like, it's insane. Can, can you stop for a second? Yes. Not everybody will know what an ace is. An ace. Uh, so, adverse childhood experience. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, I had to remember what the C was. Goodness gracious. <laughs> it's the time of day. Um, uh, to Radovid. So, for those of you that watched the Netflix series, you just saw that his brother uh, was assassinated. Um, in the books and in the games, it's his father. Um, and then in the third Witcher, we see what that means for all of the mages, for all of the folks that are not human, is that he goes on a killing spree. Like, he responds to his own trauma of having his father assassinated by killing other people. Um, and then even from the, uh, from what I talked about earlier with Regis, like, they clearly coded that woman as being mentally disabled, as needing help, as needing somebody to care for her. And it took, like, this group of outsiders and one that's a little more invincible than the other to finally stand up to these townspeople that were essentially going to execute her for being something that, honestly, they probably, being a person they just didn't want to care about instead of, uh, you know, giving her the love and giving her the help that she needs, they're like, nah, she's a witch. People hating on disabled people. This is news. <laughs> news flash. Oh my goodness. Not in the fantasy world. No, couldn't be. Not my fantasy. Um, so I think mental health generally, like it's it's one of those things that I think is is great because it doesn't fall prey to you know like the old idiom like show don't tell. 
And I feel like it does a great job of like showing you these characters' experiences as they go on their journey without like bonking you on the head with it too much. And I think that gives you the chance, like, you know, what, what separates art from entertainment is your ability to perceive it, right? And I think that's one of the great things that comes across, because like to build on Siri and to relate it up to my chapter, because I want to make it about myself, uh, you know, as she develops and goes through these, you know, traumatic events and grows a lot and does, you know, she does some shady things. She's always kind of asking herself, like, what is right? Geralt is doing this. He knows that in his quest to get to Yen, to get to Siri, he's doing things that he doesn't agree with, right? And it's that internal turmoil that I think is one of the things that I find most indicative of the series. You know, it's that, like, you really feel that the people are struggling and challenging and championing themselves in these kind of moments and that you know it, it makes them so much more holistic even some of the characters that only get like a smaller role like milva for example you know like really great stuff there and the things that like she goes through so i think just the fact that it feels like a very like it's it's a picture that you can resonate with and it really kind of like helps it and it also speaks about things in a way that is just like this is how it is it kind of doesn't wrap it up it doesn't shy away from so I think that like it, it, it makes a really solid effort. Um, so uh, of course, content warning. I don't know that we could talk about Yen's journey without <clears throat> talking about the fact that she starts uh, attempting suicide. So content, that's definitely what I'm going to be talking about right now. So if you need a minute, totally uh, give yourself that minute, please. Um, uh, but yeah, so we meet Yen, and obviously, spoiler alert as well, but we meet Yen, she's completely broken, Taseya comes by, buys her for less cost than a pig, because she literally finds her, you know, in in a barn. Um, and so from Yen's perspective, she is faced with the harsh reality that her family doesn't want her, and I don't even, like, what am I doing here, right? And so um, the... It, it almost seems like, yes, what else would somebody do in that scenario where they feel unwanted and they feel like there's no way out? Um, and uh, what's, uh, I, although as a therapist, I might say you probably would not go the Taseya route and um, <laughs> <laughs> lock her in a room and be like, you ain't dying today. Um, that's probably not how you would go about, but to say is not a therapist. Uh, and it's the, the, the dynamic of Yan waking up after her attempt and saying, you have taken power from me. I have decided I do not want to live anymore and you have taken that choice from me by forcing me to live. And to say is saying, you took, you're taking that choice from yourself. I am giving, by uh, giving you the opportunity to learn and study here, I am giving you the opportunity to restart your life. And you are taking your own power and choice away from yourself if you decide that you're out. And she basically, she says like, hey, knowing that if you still want to check out, I'm not going to stop you next time. Um, and of course, we know that that starts Yen's journey and becoming like one of the most powerful mages of all time. Um, and it was a very interesting reframe, again, as somebody who has been in, in shoes similar to Yennefer's to see uh, there's a lot of, and I know there's a chapter in the book about how questionable to say his choices are as a mentor, um, but to see uh, somebody come through as a parental figure, to see somebody when you are completely down on your luck and you don't believe that your life is worth something, to see somebody who barely knows you say, I believe that your life is worth something, so let's try this again. I don't know that there's a more powerful mental health theme out there. Um, and so I find Yen's story as a suicide survivor uh, to be like one of those things that I don't know that everybody going into the Witcher series is going looking for, like, oh, I'm feeling suicidal. Let me read through the Witcher for some advice here. But uh, it, it, was, it was very powerful. It, it drew me in and, um, man, everybody needs to say it. Not maybe the piglet part and everything, but like we need we need our Tesseus, you know. Sh okay. Again, um, again, not <clears throat> not I can't. You can't even you're not there. Therapist certified suicide prevention actions. Definitely. We'll say yes to that. We'll just, we'll, we're gonna move on. Um, so here's a fun one, and I know we we just uh, had to say goodbye to Celeste. Bye, Celeste. Uh, she's off to her. Uh, 
uh, oh gosh, it's a Tome panel, I think it is, yes. about kissing and romancing, which will be also fun. Um, <laughs> also related to The Witcher. Um, so, but before we get into to that, I, here, here's a difficult question. I would love for the audience to think about it too. And like, uh, I will ask you for your opinion. Feel free to shout it out, but just kind of like take a beat. Who is the real monster in The Witcher? Society. <laughs> <laughs> the reader. No. Oh, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia, you want to add on to the... I actually do agree with society. Um, and it's not just like society, like society, like the politics and the kingdoms, like that's a big part of it. But it's also like you go back to like reading about the elves and like the on el oh my God. and the fact that like before the conjunction of spheres, they're like, this planet's wasted. We're going to go take over that one with the unicorns and try to use their magic. Like every time you like kind of start to feel bad for a certain group, you realize that they have their own like bad actors in it. And they're all just bad acting on each other after yeah. a while. Yeah. So it's kind of like, who do you root for when and, you're like in a world like that? And do you not think that is like quintessentially, I don't know, like ethical? Like we can feel like, oh, one side is good and bad. The Witcher kind of, flop. it circumvents yeah. that because actually everyone is kind of bad. Mm -hmm. And when everyone's bad, you're just kind of left with like badness. It's just all, I'm going to put that over there because it's bad, you know what I mean? And I think for me, you know, it's like, it, I feel like just the populace. I have to agree, yeah, society, because I mean, like, you know, calling Geralt like albino freak, you know, that's not language I would use personally, but it's a direct quote. So it's like the slightest bit of difference, like being a dashing white-haired adventurer, I wouldn't know anything about it. Um, but just like the fact that the world as a whole see one small difference yes. between them and anyone else, and that is the thing that they go for. That, sorry, that was a bit claffy, but like the jugular, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's the worst of it. It's just that's, the fact that everyone is like that. That's the first thing they see, and that's the first thing they go for. Like, one of, one of the first scenes, one of the first scenes in the show and in the books is Geralt's coming in. There's been this monster terrorizing this town. He comes in covered in blood. He just definitely did a murder and, like, saved the whole town. And then these jokers come up to him, and they're, like, uh, they're coming at him for being a witcher. And, like, I literally... You know, the, the, the whole, like, did I just not kill the monster that's been bothering? Do you want me to put his head back? Like, what the hell's your problem? And it's a bunch of people coming at him just because, hey, you look a little funny, you're acting a little different. Never mind that you just literally saved us, our livestock, and our entire lives. I've decided I'm going to be a hero. And also, poor choices, right? The guy who has the monster head, I'm going to go after him and, like, come at him in a bar. I mean, come on. I mean, man just wants a pint, you know what I mean? Right. Just wants a pint after right. a hard day, monster slaying, yeah. a nice ale, that's all you want. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, Trust me, I would know. I don't know. <laughs> if, I've never been compelled to like walk into a bar and be like, that guy's covered in blood, I'm going to go mess with him. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, yeah, society. It's, it's uh, so often that comes up, the, the flip-flopping of ethics, the uh, preconceived notions of so many characters as you meet them, but the amount of characters that, um, that you know, one of the themes that recurs is judging, you know, judging a book by its cover, assuming things about people and monsters and whatever you think you already know about someone just based on uh, whatever you think you've heard. And the, I'm gonna act a hero uh, by punching down, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, if witchers are bad, I'm gonna come out the hero because I'm gonna be the guy who slayed the witcher. I mean, good luck, but also, like, that sucks. And so, I think, yeah, society. And I think, like, you know, society, like, the spoiler for the end of the books, but, like, what, what eventually kind of costs Geralt in the end? He's like, I'm done, no more fighting other people's battles, and then immediately gets involved in, like, a civil unrest moment, like a pitchforks moment, and gets taken out because he's trying to save someone. That's like, people, what are you doing? You've just killed a hero. What do you do? And that's people's fault. You know people's who isn't fault. a monster, though? Regis. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, as I promised, anybody want to add to anything other than society? Because I think you guys have really dug into society here. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else want to shout out an answer of, a, of an actual monster? You guys nailed it. Congratulations. Hey, That's yes. why you're up here. Hey. I'm there so, is no lesser, there is no greater, there is only evil. I'm so glad you brought that up because that is one of my 
my favorite parts of The Witcher um, because everybody gets it wrong. And not, not, not the direct quote, necessarily. <laughs> um, but this idea that, that Geralt is immoral or amoral. Mm. Like, there is no, you know, there's lesser, greater, middling. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, I, if I have to choose, then I choose not to choose. And I'm like, dude, not choosing is still, choosing. A choice. still a choice. Um, and so I think after he has to slay Renfri that's when you really see him as a character begin to evolve. And he ditches that idea that you, of neutrality and that there always is a side you have to take. You don't always have to do it in the way that people want you to or the way that society says, but you can't just not do anything and say that it's no choice and it's neutral because that is itself a choice and it is a political statement, even if you choose to do nothing. The set piece that that happens in is like Triss is like ill on a tr like they're in a, they're in a cargo like thing with like the elves right the dwarves right and like siri gives this brilliant monologue about how she's never going to be neutral because they're like yeah if we get attacked you're going to help girl out, right and he's like nah <laughs> i don't that's this, your train your problem like aren't we carrying your friend nah not my problem she's ill like, you know what i mean and that's where like you really see that flip of like oh i can actually no longer take that as an out mm -hmm. and you you know it forces him to develop ethically you know what i mean yeah. And so we've, we've talked about some of the darkness of, of the continent. Um, and other than Regis, what, um, what in The Witcher gives you hope? Like, why is this something that we, that we are enjoying and reading and, and giving our time to? There must be something hopeful in it. No. <laughs> okay, off the I, panel. The no, fact, the that, fa no, I disagree. The I, fact that it's dark and gloomy and, like, presents that ethics is terrible and people are bad is why I like it. I like what I like, okay? I'm not going to pretend that isn't the case. You can do better. You can do... Not you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ouch. Do better. Yes, you too, Chris, can do better. <laughs> I, think I could, but that would be far too much effort, let's be honest. There's a lot of redemption in The Witcher. There is a lot of lessons learned so that you can be better. And I think um, not a lot of uh, people would connect... Uh, Witcher with Ted Lasso, but I'm about to maybe do it. Um, this is, I, I'm, I'm here for this leap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is, is this still on, on, on point? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, this, it's this idea that like people who try to do better inspire us to do better. People who stay the course of I'm going to try to do the right thing and I'm constantly learning and correcting, continuing to do the right thing inspire us to try to keep doing the right thing. Yen gets to where she does because she watches Geralt sacrifices. She sees Tissaia sacrifices. She wants to do better. She sacrifices her entire ability to do magic because she sees, uh, she sees the potential of family, of connection being more important. And that's I, the theme of redemption and the theme of I am trying to do my best comes up all the time. Counter spell, they only do that because they did terrible things in the first place. So but like, people, it's like, oh, like it's great to redeem, but if you don't do evil things, you don't have to redeem, right? But people do <laughs> shitty, like people do bad things. I've done bad, I mean, I don't know, I haven't done yen bad things, but like, <laughs> I've done, I've done some stuff that I'm not proud of, but if I don't get the opportunity to do better if I don't have somebody who's like, you know what, not only do I believe that you can do better, I will extend my hand and help you do better, then nobody does better. The fact that Geralt comes back for Yen over and over again and shows her over and over again that she, he, she can trust him and that he's worthy of having her trust, and then he doesn't, but okay. Um, but the fact that there are characters that continue extending the hand in like, we can do better. It's a story of I, I don't know why I'm vehemently defending my position so much, but like litmus test in the audience, right? If you've played the Witcher games, what choices do you make? Do you make the good moral choices that, and everything is sunshine and rainbows, or do you do the bad thing? What sunshine and rainbow choices are there in the w what game? Yeah. What game? <laughs> okay, like, well, the, like the morally good choices. Like, oh, I won't okay, so first of all, CD Projekt Red loves to do this thing where you try to make the good choice, and then it's the bad choice. Yeah. It's, just, it's the very isn't isn't that, is that is my point. Thank you very much. But that just Thanks goes back to like, the, the traditional you goosebumps choose your own adventure. If you choose the right thing, that's when you know you're surely going to die. Like, yeah. You're just piggybacking off that. Yeah. 
But I, I, I don't know. I, oh God, it's so cheesy. I'd rather die knowing that I did the best I could by other people. I mean, I agree entirely. Once again, who did I write about? So of course I'm going yeah. to agree with this point. <laughs> anyway, so on to this. <laughs> you all haven't heard about him. But Have you heard the good word about Regis? <laughs> Listen, if anyone wants to talk about it, I'll be here all night. Um, but no, for real, because there is so much redemption. Even just watching Geralt's own growth, yeah. like from like the first few books to like Blood and Wine, which is like you know CD Projekt's red version of retiring him, and realizing how different of a character he is. Um, just the fact that like he comes across this monster that's like absolutely going to destroy a city full of people, and he's still willing to go. Well, I trust you, friend. Let's see what we can do. Like that that's not necessarily the case. Is he skeptical the whole time? Yes, but you know, he's so much he's willing to slow down, really think through things and want to do genuinely the best for everyone that's involved. And that that growth arc is incredible. So, I mean, unless Sirio Yenna can send, then everything's out the window. That's true. Geralt, Thank you. Geralt goes from <laughs> grunting to being able to like provide kind soothing words to mm -hmm. Siri because of how important she is to him. Yeah. I rest my case. We should probably, if you have any other questions, we should probably let you do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving so, this. this so is adversarial. So I'm like. I mean, the next question I have is also um, pretty controversial. So if there's anything else you want to finish this one up on. I think, I, yeah, we I think I'm very on. interested no. in the next one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, why is every single horse named Roach? <laughs> and does that reflect on Geralt's mental health? Um, it's so he doesn't I mean, want to yeah. get the name of the horse wrong, right? It's just so if, he, if, it, if they're all in the same thing, he can't get it wrong. Yeah, well, that's a lot of work naming a horse. Like, you got to get to know the horse, and then you get really sad because then if the horse passes, but you could always just tell yourself, it's just another roach. Like, it's a reincarnation of roach, or it's the next roach. So you're like, roach never dies. It's, it, how would you confront the fact that multiple times in battle, you lose your, like, one companion at some point? You just go, oh, no, he's infinite. We're good. I'm, I don't have to be sad. In infinite roach. Infinite Inf roach. Infinite roach. Okay. I mean, it's not the same roach. We all know it's not the same roach, but, like, don't tell Geralt, because that might be how the stoicism, <laughs> that might be what cracks the stoicism finally, is the, your an figuring out that your animal companion is H gone. How to ruin Geralt's day, just drive past and be like, it's not roach. <laughs> what? Okay, you're the monster. Yeah. <laughs> We settled this in the earlier question. I am society, ergo a monster. Thank you. Chris, maybe it's time for you to redeem yourself, okay? Impossible. <laughs> so what's actually kind of fun is I, I decided to do a little research on the name Roach, just for, for funsies. Um, and apparently in the original Polish, it's like a diminutive form. So like how you say kitty instead of cat, mm -hmm. or like Tommy instead of Tom. So Roach's name is actually Rochi. <laughs> so it's very That's cute. so sweet. Yeah, I, I thought so. I would like to answer the second part of your question, and yes, it does say something about Gerald's mental health. I forgot about oh, that yeah, part. Yeah, Please say yeah, more. Yeah. Uh, that's it. <laughs> oh, does and, and and what does it say? Uh, well, if it's a diminutive thing, then it's probably just like, all right, my little horse. Like we're gonna be friends. We're gonna be pals together. And then just continuing to call the horse that time and time again. It's almost kind of like a comfort thing. But Roach, I mean. He also has a lot of chemicals pumped into him, and cats hiss and run away. So if he likes cats, he's kind of screwed on that front. But he could have called the horse. Okay, but maybe there's just no other horses called Roach. It's a unique name. You can't say, that's my Roach. You're like, nah, that nah, doesn't exist, mate. There's that is true. Roach. He's just trying to be ironic. It's like having a dog and naming it cat, like that kind of thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's not that deep. I can't believe I'm saying that, Kelly. But. <laughs> <laughs> Geralt is very mentally well. There we go. We solved it. Solved it. And he is serious. fine. I don't know what y'all are doing here. Everybody's healthy. <laughs> no trauma detected. No trauma at None all. None at all. Um, so this was actually a, an, an audience question from before the panel. Um, and I thought it was very interesting, so it made the cut. So this was not in your notes, so I hope you're all ready. Uh-oh. Um, is there a monster or a beast in The Witcher, so not, not a human or like humanoid character, that you identify with? Amelia's gonna have to say something that isn't Regis, and I'm very excited. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I, it's, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna greatly disappoint you, because it's probably gonna be a Bruxa, 
Um, I appreciate how they like kind of like hide and they like kind of walk around and they like, and for those of you that played the game, is Oriana a higher vampire? Brooks, uh, I personally think she's a higher vampire regardless. And then when they like want, to, when they get angry, when they need to feed, they turn into like these creatures. They're like, <laughs> so I like to think that's me. I'm like dark and mysterious until I need to eat. And then I have a whole total personality <laughs> shift. <laughs> Excellent banter. I can't remember the names of any of the monsters, so yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. I'm, yeah, <laughs> so like, I'm probably I don't know, like I'm gonna go Striga maybe. Striga, one of those. You know what I'm saying. You know, like someone who's like cursed and then at one point just turns into a beast and kinda of just picks off people they don't like. I'll take that. I like a nice roomy castle. I could see it. Yeah, like Yeah, there we go. I, that, it's not that okay. deep because That's I fine. had That's no fine. answer prepared for this. Yeah. I, I just identify with the NFR, so I'm kind of doing the Regis thing with it. So I no, I really, I mean, I I love the ethics and the morality of all the beasts and everything, but I really, yeah, I don't have a, sorry. Well, I mean, it's one of those where like Geralt defaults to his Witcher code that's not real of like, well, I I won't kill something that's sentient, right? Mm -hmm. And that opens up this broader debate of like, well, like where does he draw the line with the monsters? And particularly in the game where you get like that great variety, there's like, oh, well, this is a creature that had this origin story and became this and developed that I think provides you with a more of a question of like, is this okay? And I think that helped bring a lot more depth to like the monsters. Like they're not just color paletting, like Mm -hmm. it's now a blue flan and now a red one because you're in a different zone, they have that a bit more, like, life to them, I guess. I relate to the geese in town. Nice. The geese. The geese, yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I support all things geese-related. Yeah. No, just, you know, trying to get out of the way, just trying to live my life. Yeah. Yeah. I just really, I was like, I have to have something. There, that's what it is. I, the first image that came into my head then is running through and then all of the like chicken and geese are running out of your way and I was like that's me because <laughs> if you saw I, if I saw Gerald that would be me mm-hmm. so yes fair yeah I would tend toward Banshee I also like to scream at people if they wake me up hey um, we're very much we're very aligned in that yeah um, so we're almost at about 15 minutes, and I do want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I've got one more for the panelists. If you have a question, there are microphones up there if you would like to come ask our panelists anything Witcher-related. Um, and maybe this, maybe this, I should have started with this, but how did you guys find the Witcher? Because obviously there's some deep love and deep knowledge here. How did you come to the Witcher? Was it the books? Was it the games? Was it the TV series? Like, where, where did this love and interest and passion come from? I don't from? remember. I, I want to almost say it was... Co- Rachel Coward. <laughs> like, I think, you know, when somebody's like obsession is, is almost like contagious, I think that was the thing because I heard about the show and I got really into the show and then I was like, it's another thing I like. But then Rachel got really into the show and then she's like, I'm reading the books. And I was like, all right, here, buckle in, we're about to have a new obsession. And then I went full in with the show and the game and that everything and the books and everything else yeah yeah i feel like really similar in that like i i own the i bought the game on a steam sale because of course i did like who, who doesn't own witcher 3 at this point you can play it on toaster like <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know what i mean and i was like i'll play this eventually and played like 20 minutes of it and i went this is too large i have no time for this and then i think i watched like the first season of the show in that like hazy fever dream it came i'm sure it came out near christmas no no it oh, started christmas. when the when the panini started that's so that exactly so, fever right dream forehead. that's yeah. exactly what i'm talking about yeah i want you to all to know that rachel just texted me i got you into it question mark i love you i love you rachel <laughs> and then from from that it was like a, okay I, the books were like on my wish list for ages and then they came up on my e-reader that's not branded. I'm not mentioning any names, so don't me. Um, listen, I'm blind, it helps, okay. Um, 99p for all of the Witcher books in one collection. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do. Thank you very much. And then just like gobbled all that up because it's very good fiction. So like I've consumed more of the books than any of the other media. And I do truly legit think that is correlated with being asked to do this project. Yeah. As I mentioned, I was two books in like at the start and then was like yeah cool and just went for it yeah it doesn't take a lot you're like into it and then one of your friends gets really into it and then you're like no i'm really into it 
Sorry. <laughs> so Amelia's is going to be, so I had this dream about this vampire, right? <laughs> um, so it actually came after the first love of my life, which is the Elder Scrolls. Uh, mm. I played Skyrim. Okay. Thank you. I love you all. Uh, so, and they're like, you like fantasy. You like open world games. What about The Witcher? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll try it. Um, and then I tried it, and I got annoyed with the mechanics, and then I put it down, and then the panini happened, and then I picked it back up, and then I met the, the first love of my life, Regis and Toussaint, and then that was it. I decided, and they're like, do you know he's a character from the books? And I was like, is he now? So then I like read all eight of the books over the course of the summer during 2020, yeah. and I just continue to consume Witcher stuff ever since, so. Uh, one last thing, have you all seen Henry Cable? What got you into the Witcher series? <laughs> he is a, he's a very I, I almost, handsome man. I almost forgot to mention it. I have rewatched him putting together that PC a few times. <laughs> okay. can, can, I, can I ask? Respectfully. <laughs> Respectfully. <laughs> uh, Amelia, do you have any thoughts on the casting for Regis in the show? Wow, you. I was, I was expecting somebody else to ask me that. I'm surprised it's you. Uh, I, I'm interested to see what happens. So for those of you that don't know, they actually cast Lawrence Fishburne as Regis, and I think temperament-wise, he's gonna nail it. Um, I am, ooh, hey, Netflix Witcher, you guys are amazing, wink. Um, there's, there's been some creative decisions that make me a little anxious, um, but I am very interested to see how he takes Regis and spins it in a way. I want to know if it's book related. I want to know if he watches the games and if he tries to combine those types. Read my chapter, sir, please. If you're out there, <laughs> it'll give you everything you need. Um, so I'm very, I'm very curious to see what happens. I'm not, not upset. I'm not excited. I'm more so in this middle ground of intrigued. All right. So we're going to hand it over to the questions. We'll start on this side. Hello. Hello. So I have a question slash commentary on the first Witcher game as it relates to the end of the Witcher book series because it didn't sit right with me at all. Specifically, the um, relationship between Geralt's lack of memory and Triss and the Alvin, the kid that came in, and how they were sort of like playing house as a mimic of what Yennefer, Ciri, and yes. Geralt had in the books. <laughs> and so I would like to hear your opinions on that as mental health professionals and content creators. Go ahead, Amelia. I am so sorry. Those of you that are Tris fans, I respect you. Go, go get it. I, I, I don't know that job. it's legal for us to talk about this without... Uh, without. I know, it's kind of tough with, with, with less yeah. here, but go ahead, yeah. Amelia, you can, you can do it. She could argue with me if she were here, trust me. Um, I, too, did not enjoy that. Um, I personally see the three games as fitting in right like at, towards the end of Lady of the Lake before that last chapter where Geralt and Yen get married. Um, and the fact that, yeah, the symbolism's all over there. Triss is acting like Yen. You know, having this kid there for Geralt to worry about and take care of is just like Siri. Like, it feels like, I'm so sorry, everyone, it feels like pure manipulation, mm -hmm. um, which is the only reason why Triss doesn't sit right with me, even though she's a lot nicer and palpable of a character in the third game, and I understand why everyone loves her so much. It is. It is so scary to watch her mimic that for him and him just assume that's what his life is like. I'm going to just be really ambivalent to no one's surprise and just be like, just what they wrote for the game, in it. Full respect, CG Project Red, CD Project Red. Full, like, they needed something. I feel like it, it makes copium sense in the canon. It's, it's separate, it's distinct. It's like more of that thing that you like in a slightly different flavor. And I just kind of accept it and therefore not think about it too hard. I also, I think Amelia is one of the few people I know that's played the first game. Yeah, I did, I did not play the first game. Sorry. I, I, I think I also own that on Steam, because it was like a quid one time. Hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, over there. Considering how traumatic and potentially lethal the Trial of the Grasses is, if its secrets were rediscovered, should a new generation of witchers be created? Who gets, to, who gets to decide that is my, my question. Like, is there, because at one point, Siri wants to become a witcher right. and does everything in her power to, so can I choose for myself? Yes, I'm gonna research the living bejesus out of this and try to figure out the code and do it, knowing that I might die? Yes, should a bunch of, Orphan boys be selected to, to, you know, to go through the trials? 
No! I mean, you know, I think it's really good to retrain and upskill, you know, especially oh, through the Panini. Right. Like, I, I could retrain as a witcher, you know, that was a thing I could do in my backyard. Are you writing a LinkedIn job post? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've upskilled, right? I've re retrained, right? And I think, I don't know, you know, I think it's an ecosystem thing. I think if you're going to be really big and haughty about it, you could be like, well, actually, if we saw the conjunction of spheres and we kind of closed all the portals and all the monsters were coming through and not being created, we therefore don't need witches, ergo, you shouldn't do it. I mean, I'm generally anti-eugenics. will always exist. Well, especially when it's society. <laughs> but, like, Geralt doesn't want to just take out society because, you know, that's where I'd go. Um, so I think, like, it's... Good question. Yeah, it, it's one of those nice. where if, if there is a necessity, then they're the best people equipped for the job, right? And therefore, you know, a witch has got to eat. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I think the combination of the choice and the necessity, because a world without monsters that aren't society, then what's a witch going to do? And therefore, it's going to be rough, and then they'll get targeted, and you'll get what? You know, the cycle that you kind of see in the books. Job, and al job. Also, they kind of, Geralt kind of denounces being a witcher towards the end of the books and that type of thing anyway. So he kind of says, like, oh, well, there's no need. Yeah, it's complicated because they need to do that when they're teenagers, um, which is kind of a hard, a hard age because you want to be, you want to be needed. But then if you're like orphan boys like Geralt, who just kind of gets scooped up, you, you're not really given a choice. You have to survive. Um, so I would like to say that if that's something for the future, I think it should have been a choice, but you know, I don't know if anyone saw the animated series, like it mm -hmm. looked rough, that looked rough. So I'm more, I'm definitely more so on that. Probably not. Uh, child abuse bad. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Child <laughs> abuse, no. Um, and like at what, 23, I signed a document saying I'm going to pay back all my graduate student loans. Oh, that <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was doing even at that age. Um, so I don't, I don't know if people can actually make an informed choice for something that big. Yeah. Um, but it is a very interesting question, and I think you've got us all thinking. I also am a witcher, so obviously a bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now you know. Mm. Now you know. Yeah. Hello. So would you say before Regis, one of the earliest examples in the book series, all forms of media, the earliest example of that sense of humanity, but all, not necessarily always the good in humanity, but that kind of sense of acceptance and love, despite his many, many flaws, would be Yaskier or Dandelion, depending on what you read. The way that you started that off, I was like, he's going to say Dandelion, he's going to say Dandelion, he's going to say Dandelion. <laughs> yes, 100%. Because even despite some of his misgivings, like, and the, the fun behavior that we get to know him for, yeah. Like, even when, like, we believed Regis died and then in the first Witcher game, like, if you have that party at Chani's and if you talk to Dandelion, he's the one that's like, you used to be friends with the monster Geralt, like, re-reminding him of his own humanity. But yes, 100%, I think Dandelion's probably the earliest example we see of that. Yes. <laughs> I love Dandelion. <laughs> Thank you. Joey Beatty is the best, yeah. best yes. casting decision ever. Oh, yes. So good. That's so cool. Everybody needs a friend like Dandelion. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. My question is in regards to uh, when Siri kind of makes that switch to Freya that we're at. In the, so spoilers for Netflix shows because that just happened. But is that kind of a question for you, Chris? Do you think that's her taking the Witcher code to like an extreme? In what is right well, is I think, wrong. I think it, you know, we touch on the mental health notes and ultimately you know, Siri has this internal turmoil of like, am I doing and is this right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately she's just trying to survive. Right. She's in like a really rough spot. She's getting hunted by that guy whose name escapes me who's like really evil but also like really skilled. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what else are you supposed to do? Oh. Like the war? Flame? The flame. Dude? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fl flame dude. Okay. Yeah. I think. Oh, you know, yeah. Flame dudes. I mean, does everybody know what we're talking about? Flame dude. Yeah. Is there Who, another? Yes. Person? Whose no. name flame is dude. also not coming up for me right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You. You know, she's getting hunted by a bunch of people. She's in a bad spot. Like, what else? When the whole world's after you, you may as well go undercover and do some crime. Right. Like, why not? Like, <laughs> cool. And I think ultimately, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, you wrote like, the <laughs> ethics chapter. <laughs> he said it's okay. Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, so I think, again, what, what I think it highlights from the, the story is that you see her discuss this in, like, the, I think it's the fifth book, yeah. uh, Tower of the Swallow. She has that big discussion. It's like, I'm doing what I need to, and I don't necessarily like that, but it's a necessity. And I think that's the growth. It's the balance of saying, 
I maybe wouldn't do this every week, right. but <laughs> this was a necessity in this instance. So, yeah, I, I also think from a psychological point of view, it's really fun that she takes that other moniker to embody that. But, you know, that's a whole other panel. Bring us back. <laughs> Fill out the survey. Yes. Um, at least personally for myself, my only large exposure to the Witcher series has been from the Netflix shows and then a little bit of the third game. Um, but one thing that I've kind of begun to pick up on the show, and that's uh, I'm sure going to be an arc in a storyline, is that uh, Geralt seems to have a lot of devoid emotions in him. And in terms of any psychological... I don't know, of those more pop or common type of, not common, but like diagnoses. How would you, I guess, personally diagnose Gerald in terms of what maybe psychological um, pathology he might have with those like devoid emotions? Can, can I take this one without the diagnosing him part? Because yeah. we, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Because we're not his therapist. I'll leave, that, I'll leave that to Kelly to disclose, to, to do the disclosure part. But <laughs> man, the dude just practices stoicism. How many, how many, I don't know about you guys, I know a lot of tech bros who are like, I am just like really into stoicism and so I don't have any feelings and depression, like I don't, uh, Tim Ferriss I think is like really into it and so it's this idea that like obviously witchers are forced into stoicism in their transition um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it from the beginning of his arc, even in the show, I just feel like it's like a, it's like a little protective mechanism. Like if I have no feelings, then you can't hurt my feelings. So it's, it's that like, I will be stoic so that I don't, yeah, I don't ever get hurt. And I think the, the important thing is, is that it's that being a witcher that is like, oh, we've removed the emotion and him beginning to feel it that makes it important, right? It's that actually development of, even when these things have supposedly been removed entirely, there's still that residual bit of, you know, emotion that and comes now, through. And now we've connected Geralt to Spock. I just, yes. I want to make sure I connect him to as many other fictional characters as possible. Yeah, I was gonna say it was the trauma. Yeah, trauma. Big T. That, that's it, big, big T drama. <laughs> Trial of grasses too, trauma. yep. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is that when everybody says you're a monster, you begin to believe it. And so if everybody says you have no feelings, you have no emotion, you can only hear that so many times before you start to believe it. And so I think if you've been getting that message since you were a very, very small child, even before the trial, like, you know, with his, with his mom, yeah. it's, it's not allowed. It's not permitted. It's not okay. It's bad to have these kinds of feelings. You're not allowed to be that way. You are this thing. Mm -hmm. And we so often try to live up to that off, always to our own detriment. Yeah, so, we, we had allegory with like, I don't know how we raise young boys, I don't know. Weird that, yeah. isn't it? Like, don't boys feel emotional. Don't cry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> funny, funny. Yeah. It's really funny. All right, we have two Thank minutes you. and 45 seconds left. So I think if we can do one minute on each, I see five minutes in the back. The front is a different one. We're going to go with it. So yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on the character of Detloff and how he sort of acts as a foil to Regis and like what Regis could have been, I guess, in a way? Uh, and how he starts out as like an empathetic character and then becomes the monster. You can tell how much I love this bloody DLC. <laughs> Just for my facial responses. Oh, thank you. It's such a good question. Um, one of the things that I think is the most interesting there is, I don't know if you or if anyone has seen the conversation between Geralt and Regis when Regis was waiting for Detlef to show up. I'm going to try to do this really fast. Um, they used to run in the same crowd, but at that point, Regis was like acting a fool, acting a, he calls himself a punk. Um, and Detlef is like, that's too much for me. Like, and he's the one that's more stoic, pulls himself back, doesn't do anything. And Regis the one, is the one like, you know, uh, scaring the locals for fun. Um, and then watching how Regis goes through his uh, recovery from addiction and getting buried in the ground for a hundred years and then having to sit with that and then realize that like, this isn't the life that I want to live anymore. And then Detlaf continues to run with his pact and really doesn't grow from that, right? Um, so it's interesting to see that if Regis didn't kind of like bottom out and have to like come back up from the top and learn from that, he could have continued to be just like Detlaf, if not worse. And of course, you know, we've got the whole thing with Sienna and then triggering Detlaf's emotions and Detlaf doesn't know how to deal with emotions. That's a whole thing. Um, but I think that's an excellent point. If we just didn't hit rock bottom, we would have seen that exactly the same. So it's interesting having those two characters that are friends and then enemies towards the end and it 
has to do with your experiences and your friendships and your connections, what you learn and grow from. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yes, last question. Yes, so a character we haven't talked about a lot is the Feathered Knight, Kahir, and obviously very different in uh, Netflix and the books, but in the books specifically, he goes through his own sort of society-based redemption arc, very separate from some of the other ones, but I just was interested in your thoughts on how like his redemption arc uh, compared to some of the other ones that we've talked about uh, and how uh, Geralt had very interesting interactions with him over the course of it uh, and that. I mean, I'm conscious of time, but ethics, isn't it? He just goes, actually, am I the bad guy? <laughs> and then goes, oh, that's not good. I want to be the good guy and change his sights. And that's it. And he, he, fo like, he follows his own moral compass that goes against those political views and sorts it out. And it's wonderful. It's also one of my favorite to watch him go from what he was until all the way at the end where he was like, you know, what I care about is making sure that Siri's okay and I'm willing to put myself aside, I'm willing to put everything that I know aside in order to do it. Please don't hurt me and accept me, I'm here for you. Like, I loved Kahir towards the end. Like, such a good character. I think it's so interesting to have a character like that where he is wrong. You know, how often do we see a character not just be wrong, but then realize I am wrong and be open to that experience of change and growth and to like do the deprogramming work that it takes for him to go on that journey and I, I have a hard time thinking of other characters like we have like you know bad to good arcs but his is like he thought he was the good guy and then realizing I'm not the good guy but that's who I want to be and that's such an interesting journey that he takes and do you want to close it out? No, ditto. No. Okay. Um, so thank you all so much. Uh, I have to run to another panel, but these three lovely humans will be here to answer any other questions if you want to chat with them. I have been told by enforcers that we can't stay in here. They have to turn over the room. But there's that little overlook area just across the way a little bit. So the panelists will be there. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts. And go enjoy The Witcher. Thank you. Thank you.